Can you guys hear me on the mic? Or do you hear my voice? Assalamu alaikum. Yes. You can hear me? Perfect. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah, we are on line 47, 48. Khalas. Bismillah. Read the Arabic first and then we do English. So just read 48 by itself. Same one. And we move to the second year. From this point on, the way that we are going to mark the change in the calendar, it is by the amounts of battles that the Prophet ﷺ participates in. For the next eight years, the Prophet ﷺ either participates or sends an army out a total of 100 times. The ones that he himself is participating in is 27 times for the next eight years. So this is a time of traveling a lot, of combining the salahs a lot, and being at the borders of the land. The Prophet ﷺ participating in 27 and in general sending 100 means that every single year there should be about 10 different battles that the Prophet is either sending people to or he's going, he, he participates in. All of the battles that are going to be mentioned in the, in the poem that we're reading, they're only those that the Prophet actually participated in. And just to make this a lot easier for us as we go through it, the Prophet وسلم, he's in Medina, which is north of Mecca. Right? So it's on top of uh, on top of Mecca. The Prophet وسلم, for the first three years, all of the battles are down south, are towards Mecca. After the fourth year, the battles begin to go to the other sides. Later on, they begin to go upwards. So towards, uh, you know, uh, like eastwards and upwards towards uh, Asham and so on. So the Prophet وسلم, was very active in like the people participating in jihad. Because this is usually when a new state is established, the first thing that it has to do, it is defend itself or attack the people that are going to be around it. The first battle that the Prophet وسلم, is, and by the way, the, the, he says, وَغَزْوَةُ الْأَبْوَى To show you how much the Prophet وسلم, and the companions used to actively participate in the battles, you are not going to find the companions after the death of the Prophet وسلم, or the tabi'een mentioning the life of the Prophet وسلم, as seerah. Today, if anyone says seerah, we understand it to be the life of the Prophet ﷺ. This is a development that comes much later. The way that they used to refer to it prior was the maghazi, the battles. So the children of the companions, they would say that our fathers used to teach us the Qur'an in the maghazi. They used to teach us the Qur'an 
And when they intend, when they say the Maghazi, we understand it to be the battle of the Prophet ﷺ, but they looked at it as this is the life of the Prophet ﷺ. Right? And if you look at the early books of the seerah, what they always mention, like the word seerah is not something that you're going to see, you're going to see yani, Kitab al-Maghazi, the books of war, the books of the battles. And all it is telling you is because how much? Ten every single year basically means ten months out of the year, you're somewhere else. And you're participating in these battles. The first one that the Prophet ﷺ actively participates in, it is Al Abwa, the Ghazwa, the Battle of Abwa. This is the second time that this name comes up here in this poem. Does anyone remember the first time it came? The Prophet's mother. She passes away in Abwa when the Prophet ﷺ is six years old. On her way back from Medina, from Medina to Mecca. So we know that Abwa is on the outskirts of Medina towards Mecca. And what happens here is for the first few years, all of the battles are going to be, there's a caravan that comes, that is coming from Asham and they're going to pass by this place on their way to Mecca from the Quraysh. They have driven us out of our homes. We're going to go and get back the property that they have, that they have taken from us. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he heard that there's going to be a caravan that is going to pass through Abwa. So the Prophet Sallallahu he gathers together an army. Now, before we get to uh, the number and so on, the defining characteristic would be the Prophet Sallallahu will always make the companions carry a flag. What flag the color is depends on what battles. Who carries it is really what the companions in the beginning used to concern themselves with. Like who is the Prophet Sallallahu going to give this flag to? And they would go generally from two different colors. You would have one that is white. You would have one that is black. Now, if these two flags, if they had the kalima or not, or if they had the thing known as the seal of the Prophet Sallallahu or not, Allah knows best. We don't know if they had those things that were written on it. All we know is that this is the color of the flags when they would go. So the first in the battle of Abwa, the one that carries it is Hamza, the uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu and the color is white. In the, in, you know, battles today are very different than they were in those times. I'm pretty sure we have seen the movies, right? One group here, one group here. This is the battlefield in between. The purpose of the flag at that time, it is basic, the person that carries it will say, this is the commander of the army. If he says, move right, you can't see him in the battle, but you could see them. So you move with the flag. If it is to retreat to go back, you can't see people moving, but you'll see the flag retreating, and you'll go, okay, this is what we have to do. If they move forward, you would move forward. They would hold the flags, and they would still fight with their hands. They would still fight with the other hands. And inshallah, as we go through, we'll, we'll see different colors and so on. So, and generally, the bigger the battle, the more flags that they are. In the bigger battles, what the Prophet ﷺ would do is the Muhajireen would have one color. The Ansar would have one color. In the Ansar, you would have different, like you'd have the Al Aus with one color, Al Khazraj with one color. Then you would have the army flag. Okay? So the, like the, the army itself will have one flag. And these smaller, we call them, you know, battalions, they'll have their smaller flags. The bigger the battle, the more you need to get the people to focus and not look at one flag, but look at, okay, this is the main flag. Here we have the flag of, of your group here. So the bigger it is, the more people you have like this, the more in need you are of being able to control each sector or each section of the army in this way. And this is generally when they would have a lot of numbers and it would come later on.
The first few battles, because the Muslims are so small in number, and theirs would all like the first few battles. The thing that we should understand: there's people from Quraysh that are coming with their trading, uh, with, with their property. The Muslims are going to go and try to get it back. So they would be like the, be, later on. For different battles, the Prophet ﷺ would make the announcement that we are going to go. And once the announcement is made, people would get ready and they would go. The other times, the Prophet ﷺ would tell, hey, I'm going to this place, people would follow him. And after this, we'll talk about Badr. But for example, in Badr, the reason why there's such a small number, it isn't because these were the only ones willing to go. They had already went on many expeditions like this where they tried to catch a caravan. And when they try to catch it, the caravan escapes them. So the people are thinking, this is going to be the same. Uh, so 300 people go with the Prophet Right? So this is what we have to keep in mind. So the Prophet Sallallahu he sets out to al -Abwa. The caravan hears, they get out of there. When the Prophet Sallallahu gets there, no fighting. There's no one there for him to fight. But what he does with the Prophet Sallallahu does is, and this is generally how it would be. There would be battles where they would get like Ghanima, they would actually participate in fighting, they would get some wealth. And there would be battles where they get to the place where they're supposed to catch them, they won't catch them. So instead, the Prophet ﷺ would enter into agreements with the tribes that are living there to say, hey, this is who we are, and let us get a contract between each other. And the contract would simply have like, you know, like th we'll call it three rules. The first one is you don't fight us, we don't fight you. So we have this agreement, we don't fight one another. If somebody attacks you, we're not going to join them in attacking you. And you do the same for us. Right? This is like this is what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would do. So when he went to uh, when he went to Abwa, there was a tribe of Banu Dhamra and Banu Bakr. The Prophet Sallam gets into this agreement. He goes back to Medina. Any questions up to this point? And this is the only thing about Abu. This is the battle. He goes there. N nobody's there to fight. Gets into the agreement with the leaders of, two, of these two different tribes. Allah, now we go back to Medina. Any questions? Like, read, read the next li the, the next line. So now we're in Rabi' al-Awwal, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam hears that there is an army or there is another caravan from the Quraysh that is going to be passing by Buwaq. Buwaq today, it is close to, um, you, have you guys heard of the city, Yanbur or Yanbur, close to there, not too far from Medina but still a little bit out of the way. And it is on the, uh, the water. Right? It's one of the cities on the shores. He hears the caravan is going to be passing there, so the Prophet wasallam, he takes 200 people and he goes there. But the, once they get there, one, the leader of this caravan is Umayyad ibn Khalaf. And we know Umayyad, one of the leaders of the Mushrikeen and one of the worst ones, he was the one that was the master of who, who was a slave? Bilal. Bilal radiallahu anhu. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he takes 200 people. Every single one of these 200 from the Muhajirin. And in the first few battles, this is how it is. The Ansar do not participate because they haven't taken this type of bay'ah to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So when he would go out in these types of moments, he would go with 
people the, only from the Muhajirin. So he takes 200 people from the Muhajirin. The one that is carrying the flag now is Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu. And again, like the battle before, the flag is white. They get to it, they wait for the uh, caravan. The caravan hears about it, they take another route, they make it back to Mecca. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he tried to catch up with them, he tried to go after them, but they were unable to. Then he stays there and uh, he meets some of the tribes there, they get into this uh, agreement once again. Then he says after that, so this is Rabi' al -Awwal. Some of the scholars, they say that it's Rabi' al -Akhar, but this happened in Rabi' al -Awwal. Then, Thumma Badri. Now, Badr, we know Badr to be the biggest battle of the second year of the, of the Hijrah. In reality, there are three different battles that are known as Badr. Okay, we have Al Badr al Sughra, this is the one that he mentions here. And then we have the big one, Badr al Kubra. And then we have Badr al So these are the three battles that take place at the wells of Badr. So this one that he mentions is not the one that we know. The Prophet ﷺ, he hears again that there's another caravan that is there waiting. Or they're going to be passing by the wells of Badr. So what are we going to do? We're going to go and intercept them. Again, 200 people. All from the Muhajirin. Again, the flag is white. They go out to them, the Quraysh, their caravan, they hear, they get out of the way and they make it back. The Prophet ﷺ goes to Badr, sees you know, the different tribes, makes an agreement with them. Right? In the beginning, this is how the battles are. You can't catch them, you go make the agreement and then you go on. And then he says after that, and, and again the name Badr is because of the wells. The wells were at a place known as Badr, and the battle is, is known as the Battle of Badr. And then he says, right after this, the thing that happened, Tahawwal al Qiblati fi Nisf Rajab. In the month of Rajab, which is the seventh month, or one of the Ashur al Hurub, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changes the Qibla. The Qibla before this, for 18 months, 18 to 17 months, the Prophet is praying towards. Now the Qibla gets changed to Kaaba. The main reason, one, Bayt al Maqdis has been the Qibla of the Anbiya before the Prophet. Every single one of them, when they would pray Salah, their Qibla was towards Bayt al Maqdis. The Prophet, same thing. But then, he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us, the Prophet وسلم, he wants to face the Kaaba. But he can't face it because Bayt al Maqdis is the opposite direction. When he was in Mecca, he used to stand, like the Kaaba, he would put it in front of him and Bayt al Maqdis in front of him. But once he went to Medina, he could no longer do this. So he could no longer face the Kaaba to pray. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us he sees like this weighing heavily on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah says we're going to change the qibla to the one that pleases me. And the one that pleased the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to the Ka'bah. From there until Yawm al-Qiyamah, the qibla of the Salah will be the Ka'bah. And this happened in Rajab. So they are 17 months or 18 months as recorded in Sahima al-Bukhari that the Prophet Sallallahu and the companions had to actually pray this way. To pray towards Bayt al-Maqdis and the Salah had already become fard at this point. So they had no option in, in you know, not praying it, it wasn't just Sunnah prayer, this was actual Salah Salah where they faced this. Today when you go to Medina, one of the things that uh, you do in the tours it is you go to Masjid Qiblatayn, the Masjid of the two Qiblas. And the reason it has this name, they're facing Bayt al Maqdis, praying Salah, and they're told the Qibla has been changed to the Kaaba. So what they do is, they end Salah, they turn around. And this is known as the Masjid of the two Qiblas. Because the one, one Salah is this way, the, when they began the Salah was this way, 
and it ended with them facing this way. Today, if you go to the masjid, the masjid they've made it bigger, alhamdulillah, you can still see like where actually the boundaries of the prior masjid were, when the companions actually did the switch. So they put the markings of like this is, and the masjid is, again, this is not the main masjid of Medina. Right? And we said before, the Prophet ﷺ, he built the big masjid, his masjid. But everybody else, what they did was, in their own neighborhoods, like we do today here in America, they started building small masajids, small places where they would go and they would pray salah and so on. Which the Qibla is not too far away from the Prophet's masjid. At that time, you know, walking is even, uh, we'll say, just like, you know, today, alhamdulillah, we have cars, we can go from one place to one place. But if I had to come from Santa Clara, uh, walking or riding an animal, it would be very hard for me to be here for five prayers. Right? Even though, alhamdulillah, 20 minutes, 25 minutes driving from my house to here. Walking, I know at least maybe an hour, two hours for me to get here. So for, to avoid this, what they started to do was build the masjid in their, in their communities. Every single masjid we have today is much better looking. Much like everything is so much better than the masajids that they had at those times. The only difference is what the masajids produce, right? They had uh, <laughs> they had not the best of the masajids, but it produced the best of people. We have the best of the masajids, and we don't produce the best of people, right? Uh, you know, I think uh, you know the Berlin Gate Masjid, uh, the one. The other Yasin Foundation place. If that was if that was taken to the time of the Prophet Sallam, that would be the biggest masjid there is. Right? Outside of outside of like and the Kaaba didn't even you have just the Kaaba itself. Right? So the way we see like that would be the biggest masjid of the Shah the Prophet the Prophet's masjid did not have a lantern until the time of Umar al Khattab. There's no light in the masjid. We go there, we have to see, mashallah. But, you know, did it have the same type of people praying? Right? May Allah make us like them. So, Masjid Qibla Tayyip is, uh, in Rajab, they, they moved and they changed the Qibla, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the Qibla to uh, Beit al Muqdis. The first battle of Badr, we said nothing happened, they make it to the wall and they go back. Read the next line, five and fifty. So, uh, uh, from what the author is saying, he makes it seem to us as the Qibla changed. After the Qibla changed, the Prophet ﷺ participated in a battle known as al Ushayn or Ushayni. Reality is, this battle happens, or this uh, we'll, we'll battle, we we'll just say that, this battle happens and then the Qibla is changed. So this is a battle that happens in Jamal al-Thani, which is the month before Rajab. And the Qibla was changed in Rajab. But to the author, his opinion is that this happened after the changing of the Qibla. This battle, Abu Sufyan is leaving Mecca to go to Asha. On his way leaving, they find out. So they say, he, we're going to catch him on his way Hashem, and they go out to go and meet him. But just the same way the Prophet is able to find out this caravan is coming, the caravan is able to find out the army is going to come after us. So they change course and they leave in a different way to get to Hashem. It is this same caravan that is going to come back on its way that leads to the battle of Badr that we know.
So this is the going from Mecca having to pass Medina to go to Asha, and then from leaving Asha having to pass Medina to go to Mecca. This is when the Prophet is going to need to catch them. So this is the, the first attempt on the caravan of Abu Sufyan. And each, generally each, the, you know, the leaders of Quraysh and, and, and their business people, each of them, they would have their schedule of when to go. Right? They would say like, uh, for example, uh, they wouldn't go every year. So this year, I would go. I would make it to Beit al-Muqdis or Shem. I would sell all of my things. Then I would buy new things, and I would leave Asham to go to back to Mecca. For this year, I'm selling all of these things that I have bought. While I'm waiting here, and I'm selling my things, during the summer there's going to be caravans that come from Yemen because of all of the things that they have bought from India that you know they've come in to Yemen, and they're going to come to Mecca. When they get to Mecca, I'm going to the things that I have sold already. Now I'm going to use that wealth to buy what these people are bringing. And then I'm going to take that along with the things from Mecca and I'm going to go to Asham in the winter to go and sell. So there will be a year where you're not traveling. So this is the year in which Abu Sufyan is traveling. The first attempt, he's able to avoid the Muslims. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he avoids them. But the next time he's going to be caught. So he goes to this uh, an, an area known as al Ushayra. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he stayed there with the tribe of Banu Madraj or Mudi. And he stayed there for uh, close to 10 days, waiting for this caravan, and then also making the agreement between him. And again, the same one that, uh, th this is actually a tribe that is a subset of Banu Dhammura that we mentioned earlier. The first people that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam entered into an agreement with. So they enter into the agreement. We're not going to fight the Muslims. The Muslims are not going to fight us. And we're not going to help one another if our enemies attack us. Then the Prophet Sallallahu goes back to Medina. This is Rajab. We said Allah changes the Qibla. After Rajab, what is the month? Sha'ban. In Sha'ban, he says, وَفَرْضُ شَهْرُ الصَّوْمِ فِي شَعْبَان In Sha'ban, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam received the verse where Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says يَا يَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامُ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ This verse all you who believe fasting has been made wajib upon you, prescribed upon you as it was to those that came before you so you could attain taqwa When this verse is revealed it's on the 27th of Sha'ban Three days for them to prepare start fasting. 17 days later, the battle of Badr. So this is how it goes. And when Ramadan was first revealed to the Prophet it was fard, but if you did not want to fast, you would pay a fidya for the day that you did not fast. So you have the choice of fasting or not fasting and paying then after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He revealed Shahr Ramadan al yunzil fihi al-Qur'an to the part where it says, فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمْ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَسُرْ This, no, no more options. You cast Ramadan, you have to fast. No more given fidya for it. Right? As soon as the month comes, and you witness the month, you have to fast. Now there are expect, you know, some uh, exceptions that is made for this verse, فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمْ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَسُرْ uh, let's say someone that's unable to do it or someone that breaks it, what do they do and so on. Now the fidya that you used to have the option of giving instead of the fasting becomes the kafara for the fasting itself. So the companions, one thing that we'll realize in, in, in Medina, the ahkam are coming to them. And you know we think that they had a lot of time to prepare for the stuff, right? for these things to, to really be coming. But once they got to Medina, majority of the wahi that is coming to the Prophet ﷺ is do this and don't do this. The time of building them in, in their iman and who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in the stories of the previous nations, that time is almost come to an end. All you hear in Medina is things you have to do. And because you're in Islamic state now, like you actually have to do these things. So they've told fasting, three days later, Ramadan is here, we have to actually start fasting. 
and so on. But any questions up to here? Should we read uh, one line or should we? Does anyone need to make wudu? Okay, we'll go one line and then at 55 we'll start to make wudu. Bismillah, read the next line. The Prophet is coming back with Abu Sufyan. Just for reference, it takes to, like, if somebody just wanted to go leave Mecca, go to Bayt al Maqdis, and go from Bayt al Maqdis, come back, like, without stopping in there and, and so on, it'll take you one month to go there, one month to come back. So you would go for one month, and let's say as soon as you get there, you're like, you know what, just Redo my supplies and go back, it will take you another month. So, this is a journey of two months. In Rajab, or before Rajab, in Jamad al Ula, he's going. He sells his stuff, he takes his time, he's, he's talking. Now, on his way back in Ramadan, on the 17th of Ramadan, he reaches Badr. The Prophet hears, you know, like this is the route that they're going to take. Take the men and we're going to go and intercept this thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that you know, He already promised one of two things for them. Either you're going to get victory, right? You're going to get victory, or you're going to get another uh, you know, agreement with the people that are there. They leave. 300, we'll say 310 from 10 to 20. The odd numbers, one of those. So 3, 11, 3, 13, 15, 17, 19. Okay? This is the amount of people that are with the Prophet. ﷺ. When they leave to go and catch Sufyan, Sufyan, Abu Sufyan sends a letter to Quraysh saying that they're coming after us. At this time, the Quraysh are not tired of all of their caravans having to switch routes, having to be cautious of what's happening. And they decide we have to go after them. And they get an army of how many people? 3,000. Not 3,000. 1,000. 1,000 people. Out of this 1,000, they had 200 horses. The Prophet's army on the other side, they have two horses. Okay? So this is, in every type of way, they are number. The Prophet, وسلم, he, as he's going to Badr, he gets notified that now the army is coming out. He offers the companions a choice here. He said, do we abandon this and go back to Medina? Or do we go? When this option was presented to the companions, the first few companions that stood up were the Muhajirin. And they said to the Prophet wherever you go, we're going to go. The Prophet continues to ask, should we go back or should we go forward? Then one of the Ansar, he stands up and he said, it is as if you want us to answer. You want us to tell you what we want to do. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said, yes. And they said to the Prophet ﷺ, if you were to take us to the water and you went into the water, we would follow you into it. Wherever you want to, for us to go, we're going to go. So he gets this bay'ah from them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَيَدْيَعِذُكُمُ اللَّهُ إِحْدَى الطَّائِفَتَيْنِ أَنَّهَا لَكُمْ 
Now they're being told, either you're going to get victory, or you're going to become a shaykh. This is all that's going to happen. This is the two options that you have. You get Jannah, or you get the Ghanimah of this world, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to be pleased with you. 310 odd, they go to Badr. The Muslims are able to reach it before the Mushrikeen. And we said Badr has wells. The Prophet says, let's wait at the, the beginning of the wells. Then some of the companions say, you know, it's better if we go to the front of the wells. Where we're standing, let's go all the way to the thing and make the army meet us with the wells are behind us. Because if they get thirsty in battle, they won't have access to the wells. We are the ones that are going to have access to it. So they go to the end and they wait for this massive army to get there. The army gets there. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They spend before the fighting there's a night. They sleep and they're going to fight the next day. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prays Qiyamul Layl the entire night. Ali ibn Abi Talib, he said, everybody was sleeping on the night of Badr except for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's praying Qiyamul Layl. On top of this, he made, during the day before the proceedings of the battle, he was making so much dua and raising his hand so high to the point where his, uh, the covering of his shoulders begin to fall off. And Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, he sees him in this way, comes and he lifts it up and he says, Allah is going to fulfill his promise. Allah will fulfill your promise. And the dua that the Prophet sallallahu is making is, Oh Allah, if, the, if this small group of believers are defeated today, there's nobody that's going to worship you on this land. No one is going to worship you in this dunya. If this small group are defeated, no one is going to be there to be able to carry this message. And then he kept making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after that, the support comes in the way of the malaika. So the way that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knew that the number was a thousand was that uh, he saw a you know, young boy from the Quraysh and he asked them, uh, how much uh, camel or how many camels do you slaughter on their way coming? And they told him, and the boy tells him, sometimes ten, sometimes nine. Right, every day that we've been on this journey from Mecca to get to Badr, at one point we slaughter nine, at the other we slaughter ten. From this they understood that a camel would feed how many people? Generally ten. Right, one camel you slaughter, uh, not like ten, ten or uh, one hundred people would be able to eat from this one cow. The days nine are slaughtered, he had about 900 people that would be able to eat from it. So from this, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam puts the number from 900 to 1,000. And this was the army of the Quraysh. The closest number is somewhere in between these two. We like to round it up and just say 1,000. But if we wanted to say how much was it actually, we would go between 950 to 960. Based on how many animals, how many camels they slaughtered, to feed the people that are in the army. We don't uh, eat meat like this anymore. Right? We don't have to go and say, this is how big my family is. I have to slaughter you know, this amount of goat or this camel. So we don't, like, we don't know how they used to do this. It was, it's hard for us to imagine. So when they get to the battlefield, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he divides the, uh, the army into three groups. You have the Muhajirin, the Aus and the Khazraj, the two tribes of the Ansar. Each one of them is going to be carrying a flag. Then there's going to be the general flag of the army. The general flag of the army, what color? Black or white? What, what, what has it been so far before? White. white. So in this one too, white is, is the general one. And the one that is carrying it is Mus'aw ibn Umayr radiallahu anhu. The one for the Muhajireen, uh, black. The one for the Al-Aws al Khazraj, black. Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh radiallahu anhu is carrying the one for the Ansar, and it is black. Ali ibn Abi Talib is carrying the one for the Muhajireen, 
and it is black. If it has the writing, we don't know. The battle begins with the tradition of sending three people forward from each side. So every, you have, like we said earlier, you had the two sides like this facing one another. But the middle would be the battlefield. So first, you have to send three people. They're going to fight one another. And then once someone declares victory at that moment, the actual battle is going to begin. So who does the Prophet send first? The first three. We should all know this one. So Ali's one. Huh? Hamza. And then? Sa'ad. And the real cause. These are the three from the Muslims. The Quraysh, they send the family of Ibn Rabi'ah. All three of them. The father and two children. The entire family gets killed. The entire family. Three, these three, they get killed. Then the, sh the battle begins now. The battle goes on and on. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa loses 14 of his companions. So 14 companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa out of the 310 and odd, we said earlier it is 10 to 20, the odd numbers in between. Some say 311, 313, 315, 17, 19. This is the army of the Muslims. They lose 14. On the other side, they lose 70. 70 of the Mushrikeen, they die in this battle. 70 of them are taken as war prisoners. And the battle ends this way. The last thing that is said to the Muslims while the people, the Quraysh are leaving and they're retreating, it is that we are going to meet at this time again next year. And we said Badr happened three times. Battle of the, a battle that has the name Badr happened three times. The first one we said was when the caravan was going. The second one was when the caravan is coming from Asham. The one that we're talking about now. A year from now, there's supposed to be another battle that will take place and will be known as the Battle of Badr. Like this is what we have for this slide. What happened to my readers? They're here. They're still here? Yeah. yeah. Okay, 52. Let's read 52. Oh, he's right there. I see him. You're blocking him. They so read 52, shall we?
Fard. If you don't pay it before Salah, and this is what happens, we've gotten used to going, someone is going to be there to take my zakat al fitr There is no way from the time that you give it, before you pray, this money goes to the hero that it needs to go to. So when inshallah Ramadan is going to come, may Allah allow us to reach it. What we are all going to do, a couple of days before it, we're going to give it. A couple of days before zakat, Ramadan ends, I'm going to get rid of zakat. The zakat al fitr everyone who is able to afford it, has to pay it. It is different than zakat al-mal, in where there is not only like is there a requirement of what that you have to have to pay, right? But also there's different like rulings on how we pay zakat zakat al-mal. Zakat al-fitr, even on uh, if a woman is pregnant, on the baby, and on herself she would pay it. If someone was a servant, like he was a slave, free or slave, they would pay it. And what it would be would be, does anyone know how much it is? Is it $10 here? We pay 15 in Seattle, so I don't know. Like 10 to 15. How much do you have to pay? It depends on which day. Yeah. Which day? No, say. Say. Oh, say. Yeah. Okay. So for us, we pay, like the cheapest that I've seen is like $7. And then generally, like you just give 15 just to be like, let me avoid all of... When I went, last Ramadan, I was in, uh, I was in Umrah, and it was like $2. I was like, here, what, like they had the stove outside leading up to Eid. They're like, okay, here you pay your two dollars, we're going to give it. During those times, what they would give would be like a, this would, we'll say a handful. So we'll fill the handful of the staples. So for them, the staples would be rice, it would be some type of grain, whether it's barley or wheat, or it would be the what they have back there for you guys, the dates. Right, this is what they would give when they would pay the cattle for them. Alhamdulillah, we make it easier now, we pay the money, someone is going to handle it for us. Tayyip, next slide. Are any questions here? Uh, no. Can we, does it have to be a food or can we give it to the needy and they buy food for, for themselves? Like, is, is it a workaround or is it supposed to be a food? So you know what, what ends up, what, what, end up, what ended up happening to this, generally they only gave food. And if you look in the books of fiqh, they only talk about food. Like you have to give, the cat of fiqh has been, what you have to give has been food. What ended up happening is we moved to this country, and when we moved to this country, what ended up happening, especially in the beginning, right? One of the, the, the interesting things about our journey in America is that our fiqh is based not on the condition we find ourselves in now, but the condition the first few Muslims that came here, they were students, how, like they were the ones that were sending questions back and getting the fatwa. And when they sent the questions back, what we failed to realize is they asked for the time that they were in. So one of the things when it came to zakat, their questions would be, there's, maybe there's no other Muslims in this entire place. I'm the only one here. How do I pay my zakat al fitr? I don't know who to give it to. Or there is maybe 10 of us. Or even let's say there's like 30 of us. But we're all students. None of us are actually in need of being able to take it. So at that time, the scholars, they looked at this situation, they said, okay, how do you go away from, like, how do we fix this, give a solution to this? Then the idea of sending the money where it came, sending the money to the Muslim lands. Send the, the money back to your family, your family will give it to someone that is in need. We just decided this is what we are going to keep doing. Now, the Muslims have grown. And they have grown to the point where the need, there's a lot of need here. I think a couple of weeks ago, I had a meeting uh, with the, the Zakat committee chairs. The people that take like from the different places. Right? And there was a, there's an older brother that runs that, it's this masjid, right? Hedge. Hedge, right? So he... And and masjid, and masjid. Uh, so I was in this meeting, I don't remember if he was there, but I, I was in this meeting and they were talking about how much zakat that they have to give out. 
And the number that you hear, you would think in this place, like this is not something that you hear. Like one of the examples, at the MCA, every month, uh, every month there's over 200,000 that goes out from Zakat to the people that are here. That means there are people that could use, when Zakat al Fitr time comes, there's people that are in need of these foods that were supposed to be given out. Or this water that we are supposed to be given out. Right? And then uh, the brothers from here, like, there, there's so many people that come and ask for zakat that there's a cap on how much an individual can get because we can't fulfill the needs of everybody. So now, if someone, like, if we think about this zakat, our first thing needs to be okay. No more this need of sending it back home. We have people here that need it. How do we better organize ourselves to where I can't, I, I can't come to you with a handful of dates. That's not going to do anything for you. Right? In those times, they had you know, a little bit of you know, eating habits and things were very different. I can't give you barley in my hand and say, hey, here's my zakat al go figure it out. You're not going to do anything with this. So what we would need is, we need, you know how we have the relief organizations that take the money and send it away? We need them to collect the zakat for us a couple of days before, and they just have the food drives where you could come and you could pick it up. One of the, uh, the masjid in Seattle, what they would do, a week before they would start gathering the, the money uh, from the zakat al fitr And they would go and they would buy the bags of rice. Even though someone is like, technically you're, you're supposed to give them like this handful, because people are, are given, they would buy a bunch of rice bags and tell the people, come on these days, pick up the zakat and fill up. So I, I, we don't, to answer his question, we, we shouldn't give money to somebody. One is very small. But we give money to someone that is eventually going to give them the food. Is eventually going to take this money, use it to buy the food and give it to the people. In a manner that is, like would actually benefit them here. So whether it's dates, whether it is you know, rice, whether it is a flour, buying the things which which I think like we'd be able to do and give it. Ah. Could we pay money or food to the non-Muslim? Is that mandatory to pay for the Muslim only? So zakat is mandatory for it to only be to Muslims. Sadaqah you should give to the others. Sadaqah you should give to everybody. The zakat whether it's fitr or zakat al-mal has to be for the Muslims. And it serves a purpose, right? Zakat al-fitr, the main reason for it, like, we know Eid. Eid, it's not just the time that we pray salah and then we go back to our lives, right? Eid is, this is, this is the day of our celebration. In those times when you would give people the food, it would be on this happiest of days for the Muslims, even me, the one that is unable to provide for myself, I have something to be joyful with. If someone is going to come to my house and give me the greetings of Eid and, and congratulate me on this, here's some date that I got. He doesn't know I got it from the zakat, but I can now give it to him. And I'm happy, I'm dignified, and he's also satisfied. Right? So this was like the purpose of, of actually like both Eids. In this Eid, zakat, we, we give food. The other Eid that comes, you have to slaughter the meat, right? When you slaughter the meat, how is it supposed to be divided? Does anyone know how the meat is supposed to be divided? Seven, one third, one third, one third, one third, one third. so three thirds. Where does one go? Like to your family, so you keep one third of this meat. One third, gift. So, so one third needy, one third for gifts. Those that are needy, they're supposed to take this, and this is what they're going to enjoy this day with. So this is the purpose of the zakat. So first, you give it to the, the they restrict it only to the, the believers. From the sadaqah, you give it to uh, whoever you want to give. There you go. Any other questions here? Okay, uh, let's go a little bit more. Uh, do one more line. Actually, let's do, read line 53, 54, 
and we'll start with uh, this is for it. Look, spill that. What is a cat in a Up to there. Bismillah. Uh, there is a difference regarding Sakah and Nah. Yeah. He materializes. The daughter of the righteous prophet passed away. No, read with the mic. One more time. There is a difference regarding Sakah and Nah. He must realize this. The daughter of the righteous prophet passed away. Rukaiya, prior to the prior to the army's return, she was the wife of Uthman. That's it. Yeah. Now. The author, he says, the Zakat al Fitr becomes wajib the 27th of Ramadan in the second year. The Zakat al Mal, the scholars, they are in disagreement on when it becomes wajib. Some will say half of the scholars, they said, with Zakat al Fitr, Zakat al Mal became fall. So this would mean the second year, the 27th of Ramadan, the Muslims had to work. It was made fard upon them to pay the cattle man. Other scholars, they say it didn't happen in this year. It happened in the year that came after. So they had the cattle fit of this year. The next year, on the 27th of Ramadan, they had the cattle man was made fard upon them. The cattle man uh, is from the five pillars, from what Islam is built upon. The Prophet ﷺ, in the order that he mentions them, zakat, zakat always comes after Salah. Today we have made it you know, even lower than Hajj. Right? Hajj is something you do once and you're finished with it. Ramadan you do it once uh, every year. Zakat, we don't pay enough attention to it. The Prophet ﷺ, he told us that the way that we purify our wealth is with the zakat. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has outlined the people that are able to get the zakat. And there are eight categories. It is, in simple terms, 2.5% of the wealth you have after you take away your liabilities. And you have passed the threshold that is needed. One of the most interesting things that happens in our time how many of you pay zakat here? Read your hand. Okay, I see mashallah hands. Do you use the price of silver or gold to determine the deserve, the value, or the threshold, gold or silver? Gold or silver? Silver. Huh? Dollars. <laughs> Dollars. I like that. I really like. So you use silver or, or silver? Silver. You. I know, I, I use the calculator too. <laughs> that makes it a lot easier. But the majority of the calculators, and this is my problem with zakat in this country, majority of the calculators you have to tell it to use silver. Gold, in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, their currency was the gold and silver. So they would trade in like actual gold pieces and silver pieces. There would be times, even though in our times like this never happens, there would be times where the silver is worth more than the gold. In the times that the silver is worth more than the gold, you use which one to determine your zakat? You use gold. 
In times that gold is more expensive than the silver, you use the silver. So you always use the, the value that is cheaper. And if you, what ends up happening is if you use the value that is cheaper, you, you pass the threshold much faster. When you use the online calculator, if you do not tell it to use silver, and they will use gold. Today, I don't think there will come a time where silver is going to overtake gold. Right? And the, the price difference is so great. And I don't think that time will come. With that in mind, majority of us spend a lot of our years waiting to pass the, the threshold of the gold price, not realizing that we have to be paying the cat this whole time that we, if we, if we, if we use this correctly. So, in gold, the Nisab is like, I think 3,000, 200, 3,400, something like that. Right? Like if you have more than this, then you take your liabilities, you take your uh, assets, but subtract them, then you're going to pay the 2.5% from this if it stays for an entire year. If you use silver, I think it's like $500. Or like 380 something. Right? If you have more than this, <laughs> Then now we start, okay, let's calculate your zakat, how much it's going to be. So, when the year comes, and it has to be not one Gregorian year. It has to be one Hijri year. Our year is 11 days shorter than the normal year. You don't want to pass because you said I'm going from January to January. This is 365 days. From January 1st to January 1st. Your zakat is going to be 11 days late. Now you're into the new year. Alright, so. Another thing. Zakat. I used to believe that all of us should send our zakats back home. Take our money, pay it to the organization. This is how much I have. Let them go and take it. From now on. I am almost close to saying it is haram for us to send our zakats back home. We have people here that need this wealth. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when the, they used to send the zakat money from Yemen to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Medina. And he used to return it and tell them, use it there, don't bring it here. So, when the time comes for us to pay zakat, don't even go far. You pray in this masjid. There's people that come here, and Allah, I, I did not believe this, by the way. We're in Silicon Valley. There's no one that needs the cat here. This, is, this was, and I think this is all of our understandings. But if you talk to the brothers that are running the zakat, like committees and all of these different messages, they don't have enough money to give to people. There's not enough money. So that means we have to give more of our zakat here. So inshallah, the next time that you pay zakat, the brother's name, you guys know the brother? Give him the money. Or sometimes just sit with him and say, okay. Just ask him how much money is going out on a weekly basis. Allah, you'd be shocked. Alright? Another uh, you know, thing just to keep in mind when calculating your zakat. You know, the, the way we handle money these days is it's very different than the way they used to handle it. Alright? Today, like, what, what I consider myself that I get a paycheck. Every month I know the social money is going to come. But I don't have the money yet. I don't have the money of uh, March. I don't have the money of February. I don't have the money like of the months coming. Do I calculate that into my zakat? Or is it because I don't have it in this time? It's good. These are some, some of the things to uh, look into inshallah. And the other thing too, let's say today is the first day of Ramadan. It's usually easier to make your zakat go from Ramadan to Ramadan or go from Hajj to Hajj. A lot easier because the other months, no one's, we're not paying attention to it. We just wait for someone to be like, hey, Ramadan is here, Hajj is here. Let's say from Ramadan to Ramadan. You pass the Nisab. On the 10th day of Ramadan, you have $10,000. On this $10,000, you have to pay zakat. If a year comes at Ramadan, on the first day. Let's say, for the next 300 days, 
until the middle of Sha'ban next year. The middle. So you have like 15 days until you have to pay his zakat. The money just stays at the 10,000. But somehow on the 17th day, you have $2,000. And this is the $2,000 that you keep until that time comes of Allah first. Do you pay 2.5% of this 2,000 or that 10,000 that you held for that long? Of the 2,000. So the 2,000. Now let's say, instead of you losing money, Ramadan is two days away. You have 10,000, you've kept this, the whole year has been there. Whether it goes up and down, doesn't matter. Just the day you started and the day you finish. Let's say you get on the last day, Allah blesses you, you get a nice bonus, now you have $30 million. This $30 million only in your bank account, one day prior to you having to pay the account. Where do you spend the 2.5% from? The money you had the year or the money at the end? No, this year, the year at the end. So now your zakat went from being maybe a hundred dollars from the two thousand, all the way to however millions it is, or however hundreds of thousands that you're going to have to pay. So what you began with is higher than the nisab, whether it goes up and down, doesn't matter. You look from the beginning date to the end date. What do I have? This is what I have to pay the cat. Things to keep in mind, inshallah. And then it says, uh, the next line talks about uh, something we'll, we'll do next week, inshallah. Uh, you have questions? Yes, if we take in, uh, in consideration the uh, economic uh, contribution, like uh -huh. inflation, uh, yeah. how do you determine the, that, that threshold of the 2.5? Is it still? So the 2.5 is still there. Yeah, yeah so, so the, the 2.5, the way that we get it, We've converted into 2.5, but the Prophet وسلم, he gave like specific amounts of how much they had to give from the things they would have to give zakat. Mm -hmm. So because they had to give like zakat from a certain amount of things, calculations led us to that this is 2.5 of the wall. Mm -hmm. right, for example, the Prophet وسلم, he said, from the things that the water uh, the rain makes it, like, gives the water to it for the plant to grow. You have to give a tenth. So you have to give a tenth of everything that grows from the ground. So your trees and things like that. Al Ashur, yeah. So one tenth. You have to give this tenth. Then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he says in the hadith, anything that is less than khamsa also, you give. There's nothing you give, but if it's more than khamsa, you give one. Right from. And also, I think, let me see if I remember the grams. <laughs> if you were to take that value of, let's say, also is like, you know, the, the things you would put on top of the camel. Mm -hmm. If you filled, if you packed of dates, let's say, you packed the dates into a bag, what a camel would be able to carry. Right, that would be, if you had five of those, one, like more than five, one of them you'd have to give it. If you had cattle, if you had animals, you'd have more than five, one of them you'd have to give. And the more the number goes up, the more the amount that you have to give goes up. So the scholars later, they came, they did the, like the value of those to what it would be at that time to buy it. And they said the amount of zakat is 2.5%. So today we have that we have easier for us to say 2.5%. So is uh, a little bit confused about when it comes to zakat, like, because uh, I know it has to, like I said, uh, mm -hmm. So you start with 10,000 and then let's say three months later, drop down to let's say 2,000, mm -hmm. you're leaving zero. Zero, yeah. So do you still start counting from the first day of Ramadan, which it was 10,000? Yeah. Or do you start counting from... So if it goes to zero, you know, you, you stop your counting. And then you yeah. count again. Count again from here. But if it goes to one, not zero, one. You keep on the counting. You keep from yeah, the first day. From the first day. Like whatever, like, like, like let's say that if the nisab is 3,500. Easy math for us to do. So if you have less than 3,500, like your total assets, after you take away the li liabilities, is less than 35. You don't have to worry about the cap. Let's say you had, you've passed in the amount that you have from this 3,500. Now you're someone that has 10,000. 
This 10,000, you pass the Nisa, today, the day you pass it, you have to start counting. So today, you get the bonus, you get the 7,000, you have this 10,000 with you. From this day, you begin counting. I have to pay zakat in this war ETF for a year. Now, it doesn't matter if you drop below the Nisa, or if you go way above it. One year from that day that you, you passed it, and there's like an amount that you have to pay zakat on, from there you begin counting. Once the money goes all the way, the time stops. But if it goes to just like one dollar, you have to keep going. And then now, this one dollar, what will end up happening is, you began above the nisab. The year comes, you have a dollar, you're under the nisab now. Because you only have one dollar, you don't have like the actual thing. Here, do you pay the cap or not? Here, you were once above the nisab when you began counting it. Now, when this time comes, you pay 2.5% of this, even lower than the nisab that you had. So you have one dollar, 2.5%. No one's going to just put the whole dollar away. <laughs> Give the whole dollar. But if it goes up, a lot easier for us to, uh, to uh, so deal with. Back to the last point, you said like if it's, let's say, the last day of the year. Yeah. And you got like, let's say, $20 million. Yep. That's, that's 20 million. Put that aside, that's not that's, even, yeah. Yeah. Because it didn't have the... Yeah, it didn't, didn't go out of it. No, so that if you get that 20 on the last day, on Sha'ban, we'll say 31st, even though our months don't go to 31st. Sha'ban 31st, you get it. And this, uh, the Maghrib time comes, now you have to pay on that 20 million on Zakat. Really? Yeah. You have to pay what? So you, you, the what? The, the la, like, let's say. Last so, day of the year. Last day of the year. Mm -hmm. This is the last day of the year ending. Yeah. And you get 20 million dollars. You had 10,000 before. Now you have this much. The Zakat is not on the 10,000 that spent a whole year. Yeah. The Zakat is on this money that you have at the end of your counting year. So the last day, the, the 31st of Sha'ban is here, Ramadan 1st is your zakat day. Ramadan 1st, if Maghrib time comes on the 31st of Sha'ban, you are going to make a lot of people happy in the masjid. <laughs> but the zakat money so, you have to pay. So that means the more you get in the end, yeah, the more you count get. towards yeah. the zakat. Yeah. Okay. The only way you don't count it is if you have no money. And now I, you get this 20 million and it hasn't went for a year. But as soon as you pass the threshold, that day you begin to count. I think maybe I misunderstood yeah. because I, I, what I've told is like the amount that you have for a year. year. So yeah. the twenty million dollars is not a year. It's I mean, not a year. Yeah. So the amount that's over the nisab for a year, at the end, that's what you pay it on. Oh, I see. Okay. Right. So that twenty million at the end of the year, you got it's it on the last day. It's over. Halas. Now you have to pay. Yeah. Right. So this is why. Uh, Inshallah, let's, 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 let's get rid of I want. I wish that we could reach a point here to where nobody comes to us in America to ask us for zakat. Right? And then we say, okay, let's go back to sending our money back home, Inshallah. Right? That's, that's, that's eventually where we want to get to. But for now, you guys do a drive, Inshallah. <laughs> zakat comes here. Forget the organizations that are going, and again, give them your sadaqah. I'm not saying that we need to, you know, I'm not telling you not to send your money back home. Okay, don't send your sadaqah as much as you want to go back home. But inshallah, zakat, look for it here. Uh, I just want to make sure that you mentioned that the type of match is uh, only for Muslims. Yes, someone asked earlier. So, uh, what if the organization gives the zakat for non-Muslims? Inshallah, this, uh, it, it, so, I think, I wouldn't give my money to those people. <laughs> uh, just to make it very simple, I wouldn't give. Like if I know they're giving it to non-Muslims, I would give, again, give your sadaqah to them. But the al man, like it is very restricted on who you can give it to. Sadaqah you, is for free. Right? Like you, today we can walk out, see somebody, we'll give them sadaqah. They come to our masjid, they need some help, we'll give them sadaqah. But the cat is, 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 again, this is, you know, like we have to take it very seriously. We don't get out of the parameters that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said on who can get it. So we'll stop here inshallah. Or do you have more questions? Khalas jazakum Allah khair. I'll see you all next week. Assalamu alaikum.